Well, here it comes. The moment has nearly arrived. The event that we have been holding our breath for now, the day that has been the subject of so many conversations over the last few weeks. That's right. Christmas is one week away. On that day, we celebrate a truth that has been a reality for nearly 2,000 years. Christ is born and has come into our world. This is what we proclaim. We proclaim that in Christ Jesus, God has come to us no matter where we are and no matter what season we are in, he comes. Now, over the last several weeks, um, we have, uh, we've been on our Advent journey, a season of preparation as we anticipate the, the celebration of um, we began the journey by, by contemplating the mighty strength of God and, uh, and the coming of the Messiah not being an accident, right? The idea of Jesus coming into our world was not God in a panic mode trying to figure out how to salvage this whole human experience thing. Instead, it was actually a plan that he had placed in place for a long, long time. The hail to Mary was all part of the plan. Next, we, can, we kind of considered the fundamental purpose of the Messiah's mission, and that was to bring peace, shalom. And, uh, and shalom, I love that um, from, from Pastor Paul's sermon. It's not this merely a warm and fuzzy kind of feeling that we get, but, but shalom is about completion. It's about how Jesus fulfills God's plan. In Jesus Christ, it is finished. And then last week, with the, uh, the help of our our younger sisters and brothers in faith, um, we ought to see and talk about how, how Christ shines his light, but more importantly, how he invites us to participate in the shining of that light in the world around us. Now, we have today. We're turning that last corner, and we are on the home stretch for the, uh, the, the, the event that is Christmas. And we have this one more thing that I'd like for us to consider um, as we kind of step into that. It's that God has made all of this happen. Nothing we have done has brought God to us. Nothing we have done has, has made that we couldn't get to him. God is the one that's made all of this happen. We couldn't compel him to action. In fact, quite the contrary, we, generally speaking, have done our very best to keep God at a distance <laughs> But here's the thing, no matter how much we try to keep God at a distance, in Christ Jesus, God comes to us. No matter where we are and no matter what season we are in, he comes. So we're going to begin today in the Old Testament. Um, we're going to start in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. So if you happen to have your Bibles, feel free. I'm going to stall for you while, you while you flip there and give you some background. Um, the king of Judah was a man by the name of Ahaz, and uh, the northern part of the kingdom, which was actually called Israel, the northern part, had already been invaded and taken over by the Assyrians, and now there was a plot to, uh, to invade Judea, uh, which was the southern part, and the idea there was ultimately they wanted to bring all of the Jews under Assyrian control, um, but God had so far protected Judah from being invaded. Now, God was simply doing his part of the covenant, you might remember. We've talked about this a bit over the last several months. Um, God's part was to protect and provide for his people. And what are we supposed to do in return? Trust and obey God. King Ahaz, he was kind of struggling with his part of the deal. And, uh, and that's where we find ourselves. So, so God is actively confounding the enemies of Judah and essentially buying King Ahaz some time. And so as he's doing that, he sends to King Ahaz um, the prophet Isaiah to, uh, to kind of give the king a chance to confess his trust in God. And what we're going to see in this text is God's message is really simple. He's going to say, let me, God, speaking to, to King Ahaz, let me give you a sign, whatever sign you want, so that you can be confident that I am real. And then you can fully trust and obey me. Okay, as we're about to see, King Ahaz doesn't actually want that evidence. <laughs> he doesn't want it because he really doesn't want to have to obey God. So let's pick it up. We are at verse 10 of, of chapter 7. 
Later, the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Make it as difficult as you want, as high as heaven or as deep as the place of death. But the king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that. Then Isaiah said, listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust, hum- uh, yeah, isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? But you exhaust the patience of my God as well. All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and we will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, there's some debate uh, as to exactly how that prophetic image played itself out in King Ahaz's time or even if it played it out during his time at all. But the words do sound familiar to you, don't they? I hope. <laughs> um, so let's jump to the, uh, to the first chapter of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Now in Matthew's account, um, Mary is already pregnant. Joseph has already elected to break off the engagement. Um, his plan is not to, uh, to publicly terminate the engagement because if he did, that would have potential consequences for Mary, namely being stoned. Um, and so he, he just wanted to quietly get out of the situation. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. This is, this is Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 20. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son. And he will be called, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Then, or when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Now, in both of these passages, we have men who are in a situation. Uh, um, Ahaz is dealing with the threat of an invasion, and Joseph is dealing with the scandal of his fiancée having apparently been unfaithful to him. Both men have actually come up with their own solutions for their problems, and in both cases, though, God has shown up with a message a message that speaks to their immediate situation as well as something that ends up being larger. Now, Ahaz chose his own plan. Joseph elected to go with God's plan. Now, in both cases, and this is important for us, God is the one who initiated the contact. It is he who comes to us first, and it was, uh, it was in this message of God coming to them, speaking, that he says, listen, I'm giving you even more information here. There's something bigger than just your immediate situation. And that larger announcement has to do with a child, a child that's going to be born. But the point that I want to make here is that it was God that made the first move in both of these cases. He is the one that comes to us. We don't go to him. He comes to us. Now, before I drop King Ahaz like a bad habit, um, he, he offers us one more detail about his character that, regretfully, we all have to recognize as a part of our character as well. You see, Ahaz did not want to see God's sign because he didn't want to lose control of his situation, or at least the control he perceived that he had. It wasn't that he was rejecting the existence of God so much as he was trying to limit the scope of God's authority in his life. He he was happy to accept God's assistance when it came to keeping invaders away. Um, But the thing is, he just didn't want to give up control. And if we're being honest, we all kind of understand that, don't we? We all know that, that we're okay with the idea of having a Savior come into our life, but we're not exactly excited about that Lord part. 
And, and that's the, the real truth of this. When we accept Jesus, we have to recognize that we need to accept the full package of Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. But don't worry. We have clever ways of keeping God in check in our lives, don't we? And, and that's, uh, that's uh, how we limit God's role is, is how we can feel like we're maintaining some kind of control. And one of our favorite ways to limit God's control is to limit where we experience God. When we declare a space or location to be sacred or holy, we're setting it apart as special, reserved for worship. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But the problem the problem arises when we imagine that, that in that place, and only in that place, does God actually have authority in our lives. I want to give you an example of how this plays out in Scripture. Um, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 28. Um, this is a, a famous thing that was the uh, a famous uh, scene, which ends up being the, uh, the impetus for a Led Zeppelin song. It is. <laughs> and so um, we're going to be talking about Jacob. We're in chapter 28, beginning at verse 12. And uh, Jacob, who would later be named, um, renamed Israel, which means wrestles with God. Jacob is, is running. He's in hiding. He's trying to stay away from his brother. That's a whole other story. We're not going to go there today. Um, but he ends up making camp, and he goes to sleep. And uh, he happens to, to lay his head against a particular stone. There's really actually nothing special about the stone, but we'll get into that. He lays his head on this stone, and, and this is what happens, beginning at verse 12. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. Now, God continues with this message of how he plans to use Jacob and his family to bless the entire world. And when Jacob wakes up, he's both excited and a bit terrified at the same time. But here's what he does. He takes that stone that he was sleeping on, and he, and he turns it up on its end, and he declares the place a holy site, suggesting that that stairway in his vision is right there in that place physically, albeit in a spiritual sense. So while this might seem kind of like a logical idea to, to do something like that there, I mean, he certainly had this really powerful vision. God wasn't actually saying that there was anything special about that place. What he was declaring was that he intended to do something special through Jacob and his kin, um, but but somehow or another, Jacob decides to, to be specific about that location. Intentionally or otherwise, Jacob was restricting the spatial location of God by declaring that heaven and earth actually come to connect right here in this place. And he named the place Bethel, which means house of God. Now this theme of limiting God spatially actually continues, and the most obvious example of that throughout the Bible is the temple. The one place where God was understood to meet directly with humanity was the temple, and very, very specifically within the Holy of Holies. If you wanted to make yourself right with God, you had to go to Jerusalem and offer your sacrifice to God there. It doesn't matter where else you lived, you had to travel to Jerusalem to make this happen. And even then, you weren't actually able to get to God. You had to trust a representative of the temple um, who would actually do the sacrifice for you because the temple priest was going to be that representative. And, and here it comes, the temple priest's controlled access to God. Now, throughout history, people have sought to reign over others by controlling power. And God was understood to be power. And so what you have is a whole system of humanity trying to find ways of controlling God. And that's what we see happening at the temple there. And go figure, Jesus has something to say about that. 
Turn, uh, turn with me to John. We're going to chapter, um, the Gospel of John, the first chapter. Yeah, we're all over the place. That's what Bill does. He's all over the Bible. Um, and, uh, and the deal is here, he's been calling his disciples, and, and he's found Nathaniel. And, uh, and Nathaniel's been really impressed all of a sudden because Jesus said something about how he spotted him under a fig tree, and that somehow got Nathaniel's um, attention. We don't exactly know why. That's kind of lost on us. But, but as, as Jesus is speaking to Nathaniel, he says something that's really, really important. Um, he says, uh, you'll see greater things than these. And then at verse 51, then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and and earth. So you see what Jesus has just done? Jacob's, he had the stairway, the, the, this connection between heaven and earth as a place called Bethel. The Jews had redefined that location to be the temple so that they could control access. But Jesus is announcing that he is the stairway to heaven. He is the one that bridges the gap between God and humanity. He is the way, the truth, and the life, it is he who is the one that brings us in relationship directly with God. Jesus ends up affirming this point um, just a couple of chapters later. Um, in chapter 4, um, Jesus is having a conversation with a woman at the well. And uh, um, <laughs> it's a great conversation. You should read it. Um, at this point, we're going to pick up while she's trying to steer the conversation away from her marital status. And, uh, um, and we're going to hear what she has to say right now. She says, so tell me why it is that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the place to, of worship, while we Samaritans claim that it's here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. And then skipping to verse 23. But the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So when we think about this, if we have the right perspective, which is to just genuinely be lifting our hearts to God, he's there with us, no matter where you are. Sacred spaces have utilities to us. Um, they're a tool to remind us of God's presence. But make no mistake, when you declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior, everywhere you go and every place you stand is holy ground. Think about that for a minute. A kingdom is defined as a region where people who worship a king live. If we worship Christ as our king, that means this right here where we are standing is a part of his kingdom. And every time we go home, where we stand is also a part of his kingdom. That's kind of an amazing thing. So in Christ, God comes to us no matter where we are, and no matter what season we are in. Now, there's, there's another way that we frequently attempt to limit God in our lives, and it's a matter of time. Many of us restrict our contemplation of God to Sunday mornings. It's true, if we want to be honest about it. We put some extra emphasis and think about God a little bit more on Sunday mornings, and we're okay with that. We'll keep it on Sunday mornings so long as it doesn't, you know, interfere with us being able to watch the game. Unless, of course, you're a Cardinals fan, in which case you've been on your knees to the end of every fourth quarter <laughs> praying for a miracle that doesn't appear to be happening. Hope springs eternal. But but if you've noticed, you know, Sundays is the kind of the time that we generally reserve for God. And then oftentimes outside of Sundays, we might not be thinking of them too much. Now, we happen to be in a season in particular um, where maybe just in the last few weeks of particular, you've been able to talk about God just a little bit more. And even more specifically, been thinking about Jesus Christ. 
Um, I like the way uh, uh, one of my favorite rock bands put it. They, they, they sing a song about Christmas Eve, and, uh, and one of the lines in the song is that, speaking of Christmas Eve, now here is the danger that even with strangers, inside of this night, it's easier to believe. And it's true. Many of us are here in this worship service today because it seems like a good time of year to actually come to church. And, and I got to tell you, I admit this too. I, I love the energy of all of us gathering together and worshiping Jesus. So I'm not complaining at all. It's not though that this is a special time of year. It is, but, but the thing is God's with us always. It's not just that, that we can uh, um, worship during the month of December or the tail end of December, but, but God is wanting us to worship well beyond that. So we feel comfortable being here, and what's funny is this time of year, it even feels comfortable to invite others to come join us, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, it is really a really a good feeling, and there are a lot of people that are going to be gathering in this place um, a, not quite a week from now on Saturday evening, um, and who knows where God has been at work in their lives or in our own lives as we gather together, and my prayer is that as we do, that we actually get to experience the presence of God in a way that moves all of us to deeper faith. Or, or you know what? Maybe God's going to draw some of us to just start asking hard questions that have needed to be asked for a long time. And that's okay, because that's what God does. And here's the good news, is that God will keep working to answer those questions even after next Sunday. Because God is not restricted by our time limitations. This is a reminder for us to know that the, the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit is accessible to us 24-7. God is not any more available on Sundays than he is any other time, nor does he limit his big miracles to only the latter half of December. No, God has entered our reality so that he can be incarnate for us to always know his presence, no matter where or when we are. In Christ Jesus, God comes to us, no matter where we are and no matter what season we are in, he comes to us. Okay, so God transcends spatial and temporal limitations that we might try to place on him, and, uh, and even though we, we might not have asked him to come or even knew that we could ask him to come into our life, he has, in fact, come. There is, however, one more issue that remains. In Christ Jesus, God has come to you, no matter where you are, and no matter what season you are in. So here's the question. Will you accept him? I, I want to go back to Joseph for a minute, and that, and that scene with the angel Gabriel. When, when the angel Gabriel appeared to him, um, he had a choice. Joseph had a choice to trust and obey or to do it his own way. Now, we need to be clear about what this choice was for Joseph. Joseph had already come up with the plan, his own way, and his own way would have been much, much easier. Think about that for a minute. His own way was totally justified by the world's standards. It was smart and it was compassionate. It was smart in that it would get him out of a situation where he would be marrying a woman pregnant with somebody else's child, and he knew that it wasn't his child. It was going to be compassionate because he wasn't going to be throwing Mary into the spotlight of public shame and judgment and the consequences that could have gone with it. Joseph could have just moved on with his life and lived happily ever after. Instead, he chose to trust and obey the instructions of the angel Gabriel. And in doing so, this meant that he was going to marry a pregnant woman. It also meant that most people would have assumed that he, Joseph, had defiled Mary by getting her pregnant before marriage. Everyone would assume that Joseph was the bad guy that took advantage of his fiance. Now, the life we live is an opportunity. And, and as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we all have to recognize that that choice, just like Joseph's, is not going to be easy. Frequently, it's going to be very hard. 
In fact, by the world's standards, the idea of trusting and obeying God is a terrible option. <laughs> the world's standards focus on the immediate and the selfish, right? The world's standards will only look beyond the immediate and the selfish if it perceives that there is some long-term selfish product that we can get out of it, advantage to be had. The world's standards simply don't recognize this truth, that in Christ Jesus, God comes to us. No matter where we are, and no matter what season we are in, he comes to us. The world's standards are irrelevant in comparison to the truth of God's incarnation. When we stop and consider that God, the creator of the universe, the one who put the stars in their places, the one who breathes life into all humanity, the God that transcends time and space and holds the cosmos together, think about this, that God cares about you. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 6, Jesus says this. What is the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. God loves you. And in Christ, God comes to you. No matter where you are and no matter what season of life you are in, he comes to you. So here's that question again. Are you planning on doing it your own way? Are you going to trust in the God who loves you enough to send his only son to live and die among us so that we can trust and obey in him? Please pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we just consider what it means that you come to us, that you're the one that takes initiative, that you're the one who enters into our reality, that you're the one who cares more than we do, we just give thanks, Lord. And as we get ready to celebrate um, in a week the, the event of your son coming into the world, we ask that you would help us to recognize that you have been entering into our hearts and into our lives for, for a whole lot longer. Whether we've been aware of it or not, Lord, you have been walking with us. You have been loving on us. You've been helping us all along, oftentimes with us oblivious to that truth. But we ask right now, Lord, that you would open our hearts to just be more aware of your presence, to recognize that you have come to us and that you continue to come to us no matter where we are or what season in life we are in. You come to love each of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.